I can trace why I became a chef right back to my grandfather. I grew up in Elizabeth. We lived in a four family, and I had an aunt upstairs. I had my grandparents in the back. I wake up three o'clock in the morning to that smell. My grandfather frying peppers and onions. We would go mostly crabbing and clamming. We would catch two bushels of crabs and a bushel of clams and fish. I had clean all the crabs and clams and fish, filet of fish. I think at a young age, I realized the power of food and this idea that food brings people around the table. From the University of Tulsa and Public Radio Tulsa, this is Switchyard, a podcast for people hungry for eye-opening essays, moving fiction, soul-stirring poetry, and honest, thought-provoking conversation. I'm Ted Genoways, editor of Switchyard Magazine, and your host. Join me and our lineup of literary all-stars as we think through and hash out our world's difficult and fascinating challenges. In this episode, we speak with Tom Colicchio, chef, activist, and contributor to Switchyard's special issue on food. Colicchio is arguably the best-known chef on the planet. He's a five-time James Beard Foundation Award winner, including the award for Outstanding Chef. For 21 seasons, he's been the lead judge of the Emmy Award-winning TV show, Top Chef. And he is also the author of three books, including the James Beard Foundation award-winning classic, Think Like a Chef. When I arrived in New York at the end of September to speak with Colicchio, the city was suddenly beset by a torrential downpour. It flooded the streets and closed down the subways from Brooklyn, where Colicchio lives. I thought for certain we would have to reschedule. But Colicchio arrived at his Manhattan restaurant right on time at the wheel of his car. He set about checking in with his staff, figuring out who would be able to make it that day, who might need a ride, who could offer to carpool. The mood was calm, focused and deliberate, but unfazed. When everything was under control, he assured me that the dinner service and my dinner reservation for the evening was in no danger. We went to Mr. Bronx Audio just around the corner for this conversation. What's happening? I'm going to start gathering the animals and put them on the boat. <laughs> Tom, thank you for joining us, especially on this rainy day in New York City where the weather is creating a little bit of havoc for you. Can you tell us what's going on? So I guess the rain started really hard last night around 11 o'clock, and it's been coming down like cats and dogs, as they say. But subways are now suspended for two hours at least. I have no staff in my restaurant. We're prepping for dinner as well as a 60-person wedding for tomorrow, and I haven't prepped in a long time. I may have to prep today, which I'm really not looking forward to, but it's all part of running a restaurant, I guess. And you were doing walkthroughs. What are you looking for on a day like this when you're doing a walkthrough? Usually the first thing I do when I walk into my kitchen, I walk into the walk-ins. Because if it's organized, even on a busy weekend coming up and it's packed full of stuff, if it's organized and I can see, just take a quick inventory of what's there and I can tell right away if things are running smoothly. There's just a sense you get from going in the walk-in. We have two walk-ins. One is for fish and meat, and the other one is for produce and dairy. I walk in there, look around, and get a pretty good sense. And then it's just meeting with the chef very quickly in the kitchen. Anything going on? What are you working on? Just give feedback and stuff like that. And that's really it. So I want to take you all the way back to the beginning. You've talked about some of this before, but for listeners who don't know your background, start at the beginning. Take us back to... Elizabeth, New Jersey, to your childhood home. Tell us what it was like. So I grew up in Elizabeth. We lived in a four family, and there were two four families on the lot. And I had an aunt upstairs. I had my grandparents in the back, various other family friends. So my grandfather was always very present in my life. At this point, he'd retired. 
And I would do a lot of things with him. He had a little workshop in the basement. And so when it came time to do the Cub Scouts Pinewood Derby, he was the one who shaped the car with me. And he was the one who drilled yep. the holes into the bottom and yep. dropped lead and then covered them up <laughs> so you couldn't see it yep. to make it a little heavier. I would spend time in his workshop with him tinkering around. He was always a big presence in my life. I can trace why I became a chef right back to my grandfather. So fishing, I had two jobs when it came to fishing. I would wake up in the morning and always smell peppers and onions. To this day, whenever I go fishing, I always make it fried peppers and onions, either a frittata or scrambled eggs or something. Like that. that smell to me is that morning. I wake up in the morning at 3 o'clock in the morning to that smell. My grandfather frying peppers and onions. So my two jobs were, you know, we would go mostly crabbing and clamming. Sometimes we'd catch a fish. He wasn't such a good fisherman, my grandfather, but he was a pretty good crabber and clammer. But we would catch two bushels of crabs and a bushel of clams and whatever fish. So we always prepared crabs a little differently than most. And I thought this was the only way to prepare them until I was a teenager and realized that, no, it's not the case. But we would steam them the way you normally would steam crab. But then we'd take the shell off, take the gills out, and then put them in marinara sauce hmm. and let that simmer for about a half an hour and then serve linguine with this, we call it crab gravy, over the top. And then we pick the crabs. And if we had clams, it was always steamed, white wine, garlic, parsley, olive oil type of thing. Fish always fried. But my two jobs were, I had to clean all the crabs and clams and fish, filet fish. So at six, seven years old, I had a knife in my hand. Yep. Not quite sure why they trust me with a knife in my hand at that age, but they did. And my other job was I had to keep my grandfather awake on the ride home. That was like a real job. Yeah. Like, no, you I mean. have to keep away. Now, <laughs> I was definitely in the front seat. Most likely did not have a seatbelt on because this was yeah. the 70s and we, we didn't do that then. <laughs> and he would also smoke constantly. So I'd sit there and just watch him and he'd start nodding off. I'd just kind of <laughs> nudge him. And he'd always say the same thing. I'm not sleeping. I'm resting my eyes. Yeah. <laughs> we always made it home. <laughs> it but there were times like I had to hit him. But what happened when we caught these crabs and clams, it was because we had so much food. It was friends and extended family coming over. It was 20 people around a table. And of course, the conversation was always about the big fish or big crab that got away and this family gossip and sports and not so much politics because I think we were all pretty much on the same plane there. So we didn't get into too many arguments about that. But I think at a young age, I realized the power of food and this idea that food brings people around the table. So thinking of the life in food and not really even thinking about restaurants at that point, but just the power that food has. And to this day, I love to get together with friends and throwing dinner parties. To me, even more than working in a restaurant, I like cooking at home. When I was about 15 or so, now I didn't have the kind of dad that sat down and had these long conversations with you, you know, son, <laughs> what are you doing in your life? My father was pretty quiet and my father was, he was kind of an interesting character. He was clearly very bright, but didn't go to college. He was a hair cutter. He had a barber shop. He was a barber and he was also a gambler and didn't know this as a kid. But one day he came home and the barbershop was sold. I found out much later in life he lost to gambling and he became a corrections officer. But he never had these long conversations. But I think I started cooking at home when I was about 12, like really cooking on my own. We'd work through stuff and I would always struggle with recipes. Now, most likely would have been diagnosed with ADHD. My three children all clinically diagnosed. I see a lot of the same issues that I have. So I would always struggle through recipes. I couldn't quite understand what they were trying to get at. And an example is get a shoulder of lamb and truss it, sear it on all sides in a sartoire, remove it, add mirepoix cut into quarter inch pieces. What is all this stuff? <laughs> when it's brown, add the meat back in, add two cups of red wine, four cups of chicken stock, a bouquet garni, okay, put it back in the pot, bring it to a simmer, put it in the oven for three hours. Well, they simply could have said braised lamb shoulder because that's right. all we're doing. So when I was about 15 or so, two things that my father did. One, he shows up these books one day, and one of them was Jacques Pepin's La Technique. And for those that don't know the book, it's a book about techniques. And it's all done in these black and white photos. And there's tons of them just showing these various techniques, how to make a stock properly, how to skim it properly, how to make a consomme, then once you have a stock, all those things. Talk about the importance of knife skills. And there's silly things like making a rabbit out of an olive, crazy stuff like that. But there's a lot of really useful information there. But really, if you read through the text, he was stressing this idea of you have to learn to cook. Forget about recipes, learning the basics of the building blocks of cooking. And the last little paragraph of the preface said, don't treat this as a recipe book, treat it as an apprenticeship. My father said he got it from the library at work. So I had no idea, I actually gave this away, <laughs> but I had no idea what this book was doing in the county right, jail right. library, but there it was and it changed my life. Also around the same time, my dad, who never had these deep discussions with just kind of off the cuff said, you should think about becoming a chef. So to me, it was like, 
my dad, who was kind of aloof, I guess he's really paying attention. And it set me on that course. I had never thought of that. And also because of my ADHD, I was the classic, you should be doing this level work and you're not, you're lazy, you're a cut up. And I was like, all right, I'm a cut up. Great. You label me a cut up, I'll be a cut up. <laughs> and was thrown out of schools. The last thing I wanted to do was go to school. Like, there's no freaking way I'm going to school. For me, it was like, I'm going to cook. And I got a job, I think when I was like 15 or 16, working in restaurants, but not in the kitchen. But right out of high school, I was working in a kitchen and it was Evelyn's Seafood Restaurant. And we would do a thousand covers on a Saturday night. And it was great. Here I was, a 17-year-old kid working with a lot of college waitresses <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of cooks who were exactly what you'd think, like ragtag group of partying, drug-taking, drinking misfits. And what were you making? What were you learning to make there? Oh, well, this is what was interesting there. So when they first put me on the line, I worked in an area called a bench. This wasn't set up like a regular restaurant kitchen, but it was their own version of a kitchen. <laughs> but the bench area, you pulled the tickets when the tickets came in mm -hmm. and you got the orders going. Plus you opened up clams and oysters, mostly <laughs> clams. Back then, a lot of people weren't eating oysters, a lot of clams. I got pretty good opening clams, but I wasn't fast enough and I would miss orders Probably because of the ADHD, I would just miss it and like stuff would go missing. So they put me downstairs in a prep kitchen. I lasted about two days on the line. They, <laughs> they put me down in the prep kitchen. And the first day, they pulled out 150 pounds of shrimp. And these were like 10 to 12 or whatever. So they weren't like big shrimp. And I peeled that and they put another 100 pounds of another shrimp in front of me. And I literally fell asleep. And this took me all day. I fell asleep over the bowl of shrimp. One of the servers came down. She found me. She was like, you got to wake up. And then everybody's laughing at me. Prep kitchen was supposed to do this. Like the eight guys in the prep kitchen, they just like <laughs> shit on me. Like, here you go, rookie. But it was fun. I worked there for about a year and a half and then worked through the stations. But when you say this was a broiled and fried seafood place, so that was the extent of it. But any of the cooking that actually happened, so making the shrimp stuffing and crab cakes and making soups and stuff like that, there was this older black gentleman named Slim, and that was his domain. And he took me under his wing a little bit, and he would show me, they give me this recipe book, but I don't use it. He would tell me, I cook cooking for a long time. So I can't say he was a mentor, but he would just show me stuff. But I was reading all the magazines at this point. When I was probably 13, my cousin had a beauty salon. My mother was getting her hair done. Most likely I was being punished because I was <laughs> dragged along with my mother. It clearly was a punishment. And I was sitting there and they have all these magazines and I'm looking through the car and driver and the other gossip magazines. And I pick up this one magazine, it's called Cuisine. I'm like, wow, what's this? And the cover was this older black woman on a porch. And it was all about Creole and Cajun cooking. And this was before K-Paul, before Emerald and all, and anybody knew anything going on in Louisiana. And they talked about the history of this food coming down from the French Canadians from Arcadia down the coast, ended up in the hands of slaves and former slaves, and then this cuisine developed. And I was sort of reading through it, and I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. And there was a recipe for a baked stuffed eggplant. I guess they call it pierogue in the South. So you roast the eggplant, you hollowed it out, and then you took some onion, some celery, the eggplant that you scooped out, and some zucchini, a little tomato, and shrimp. And it kind of made this little mixture, put it back in the eggplant and a little cheese over the top and broiled it. So I made that and not realizing that it was an appetizer. I right, served it right. and the family was like, okay, where's the rest <laughs> of the meal? I kept finding this stuff. And so for me, I knew my heart wasn't in this fried and broiled seafood restaurant. And even I would mess around, I would tell people, I'm going to be a chef one day. And so I remember this one, we were slow in the afternoon, this one woman who was worked the breading station. She actually had to bread all the fried stuff. Because actually it was bread to order, which is kind of neat. But she said, so what kind of stuff are you talking about? So I made this dish and it was sauteed fluke with a crab on the top and asparagus and a beurre blanc. And I made it and she was like, wow, this is really good. <laughs> yeah, this is what I'm talking about. Like, I don't want to do this shit. So there was food always around. And that's how I grew up, not with gourmet food at all, but with food being important, food meaning something for the holidays. And I had to be at the dinner table every night, six o'clock, we had dinner and we were required to be there. And my mother would cook and she had her repertoire. And my dad, every now and then would try to do something. He would always go to a restaurant and see something and try to make it at home. And it was interesting. And what was your mom's repertoire? Is there anything that you yeah. think of as a signature dish? Well, or? well, every Sunday was gravy, macaroni and gravy. When I say gravy, it was yeah. red. It was not brown. It wasn't white. But it wasn't marinara sauce. So technically, it's a sauce made with meat dripping. So once you fry meatballs and sausage and brajol and you put it into the marinara sauce, it becomes a gravy. But she would do things like chicken marsala. She did this dish that she called steak from my all. I have no idea where it came from, but it was 
little chunks of steak and then with peppers, onions, and mushrooms and a little sherry wine. She would do pork chops with cherry peppers and onions and vinegar. And she would make things like she did this crab. And I still make my version of it, but it was almost like a rice peel-off with crab in it. But it was like imitation crab stick. It wasn't crab. And she would do that. And she would make these great fried chicken wings. And she had this little deep fryer, this little round thing, I remember. And it was like a salt and pepper deep fried. No breading, just fried. And it was good. And then occasionally there was like a steak, but it was always like a London broil type thing. You could always tell my father had a winning week. We had steak. (laughs) I guess dad won. (laughs) But yeah, my mother was a pretty good cook. And every now and then do stuff like stuffed artichokes and she'd read books, but she had her repertoire and she'd usually cycle through it. And there was stuff like meatloaf and the usual stuff, mashed potatoes. She was always home. She was also the typical mom where she would cook and she was the last person to sit down. So you graduated from high school. Mm-hmm. You're not going to college. Yeah. You've chosen this path, yeah. but how do you get there? How do you get started? I couldn't see myself sitting in a classroom. I hated that, but I love to learn. Well, I planned on going to culinary school. A friend of my father's who did refrigeration and air conditioning for restaurants said, hey, there's this culinary school called Culinary Institute of America. Maybe you want to talk to Tom about that. So we went up to school or we got some brochures. I don't remember going, but you had to work in two restaurants before they would accept you. I'm not sure if that's the case anymore. So I started working. And also, I read everything I could possibly read. Every magazine, every book of interest. I knew what was going on in Europe. I knew who the chefs were. I knew the food they were doing. I could look at a bunch of photos and say, yeah, that's Trois Gros, that's Paul Bocuse, that's Alain Chappelle. How did you know what to read? How were you finding these things? Well, in magazines. Sure. And then you read magazines from front to cover, and all of a sudden, oh, this book called The Great Chefs of Europe or Great Chefs of France. So you get that, and it was a series, too. So then you start studying. You start buying their books. And then I bounced around and worked. I ended up taking a job at a restaurant called 40 Main Street. It was in Milburn, New Jersey, and it was a storefront. And I applied for a shoe sash position, but it was already taken, so I took a cook job there. And that was the first restaurant that we were doing, actually, interesting food. We would do a menu every day. So there was a chef, his name was Jim Smith. He would come in. We'd sit around the table. The sous chef was a guy named Jerry Bryan, who I'm still very good friends with him to this day. We ended up going back to that restaurant at Co-Chefs. And we would sit around a table, and he would say, okay, I have wild mushrooms in today. I got some pheasants in today. I got some quail. And we would come up with a menu and do that every day. So you started to learn to create a process. And I was a line cook and it was a busy restaurant and there was only three of us on the line. So you kind of got in there. And then I got together with my friend Jerry, who had already worked in New York, and another friend, Bill Rogers, who was a server at the time, but wanted to work in the kitchen. And he's a chef now. So like, you got to go to New York. I was like, all right. Growing up in Elizabeth, New Jersey, you could see the skyline. You could see the towers there. We would go in on class trips every now and then to museums, but New York was New York. And I always thought, you go to New York, you have one shot, and if you're not ready, you're never going to work there again. I believe this shit. So (laughs) I decide I'm going to go to New York, and I get my resume all ready, and I worked at a bunch of restaurants. And the restaurant that I wanted to work was Quilted Giraffe. I remember reading in one of the magazines, I think it was Cuisine before it finally closed, but they did a roundup of new restaurants in New York. And I remember reading the Quilted Giraffe little piece, and I was like, wow, this is really interesting. So I go to Quilted to do the interview, and Barry was funny. Barry Wine was the chef owner. And then there was a chef of cuisine guy named Noel Comez, who went on to start Tomcat Bakery. And Barry's like, I don't hire people like you, people like me, because he was a career changer. He was an attorney and then opened a restaurant. He was like, I like to hire people who are career changers. And he had a whole kitchen full of them. So he brought me in. He goes, all right, you have to trail one week, and I'll let you know if I'm going to hire you. I go in. I'm working. And I'm training for a station. He had a very quirky expediting system. And the station that I was getting trained for kind of ran the timing of it all. And so I kind of look at it. It's all shorter cooking. It was really interesting. And it was all done by design. Barry, when he started cooking, he had this system where everything had to be done in 10 minutes from the time the ticket was fired, you had to get everything cooked and get it to the station to get played in 10 minutes. And he figured if he can cook everything in 10 minutes, you can't screw anything up. It's serious. <laughs> so a lot of it was shorter cooking, yeah. but it was really good. It was interesting and there were interesting sauces and stuff. And he also had this way of plating that was really unique because nothing was laid out. He would just drop food <laughs> and leave it. And I thought it was really, really cool. And I still do that to this day. It's fun. But I go there the first day and there's this woman working the station and she's struggling and he's yelling at me. I'm like, the hell? I go home to my girlfriend, like, I'm getting yelled at. I'm just trying. I'm not doing anything. She's, 
The same thing happened the second day. Third day, I'm like, fuck. So I go, <laughs> fourth day, it's like, I really want, so I remember talking to my girlfriend, I was like, Reggie, I want this job, but I'm getting yelled at. And she said, well, do something about it. So <laughs> service starts, and this woman's name was Marcy. And I said, Marcy, she said, Wes, do me a favor. She said, get the fuck out of my way. <laughs> She looked at me. I said, I'm sorry. I really want this job. And I keep getting yelled at for the work that you're doing. And can I just take the station over? She said, go ahead. This is my last day. What do I care? So I did. And he hired me. And it was great. Within, I think, two or three months, I was a sous chef. And partly because, as Barry likes to say, I can move a lot of pots and pans around very quickly. And they'd bring a baby lamb in and say, who could butcher this? I'm like, yeah, I can. Give me it. It was great. And I worked there for about a year. And when I left as a chef, I had a plan. I was like, I want to be a chef in New York, but I'm going to go back to New Jersey and work on my style out of the limelight. I'll be in New Jersey to do that. But I learned a lot there. I learned a lot about running a restaurant. But then I got to 40 Main Street, and that was my first chef's job. And tell me about when you say you're looking to develop your own style, first of all, what that means, but also it's a pretty auspicious moment in Mm -hmm. the American food scene where there are a lot of things happening that I imagine you're taking in and responding to in some way. Yeah. I guess the best part about starting when I started, that's when American food was blowing up. This is when Alice Waters was doing her thing at Chez Panisse, and there was all the California chefs doing that type of cuisine, and obviously all the French chefs in New York working, and a handful of people in Chicago. There was good stuff happening. When I said earlier where I can look at a plate and know what chef did that, that was directly related to Nouvelle Cuisine. So Nouvelle Cuisine, 50-something years old now, but most people think of Nouvelle Cuisine about lighter sauces, getting rid of flour, and finding different ingredients. Like the kiwi was the darling of Nouvelle Cuisine, right? (laughs) But what most people forget was prior to that, all the food was like French served off of carts in the dining room. No one plated food. There was a repertoire of dishes, and some of them were regional, but everything was plated in the dining room. So there was no signature. After Nouvelle Cuisine, that's when the chefs were plating in the kitchen. So you started seeing styles of plating. So if I knew that I can pick out certain chefs, well, I wanted that style for myself. I wanted someone to look at that food and say, that's Tom's food. You knew Charlie Palmer had a certain style of plating. John George had a certain style. Over the years, this has all developed. I mean, Daniel Ballou did, Thomas Kelly. You knew this. And if you were in the know, you can tell. So I wanted my signature too. So that's why I say I wanted to go and develop that in New Jersey. And, of course, right around this time, too, somewhere in there, I did some stages. One in Gascony, working for Ariane Degan, who started D'Artagnan. Her father had a two-star Michelin restaurant in Gascony in Osh. And I worked there for about three months. And that was really great because I worked there in the fall. And that's the land of foie gras, cassoulet, and ducks, and lots of wild game and mushrooms, and the kind of food that I love. So I spent some time there. And then I had set up a couple years later two restaurants that I wanted to work and I wanted to work for Michel Bra in La Guiole and for Alan Ducasse. And this is before Alan Ducasse was a big name. And what I heard from various chefs, this is the guy doing some great stuff. And I had that set up and then my dad was diagnosed with lung cancer and it was inoperable and he was I had very little time left to live. So I didn't go and I took this job at Mondrian and that was my first chef's job in New York. But I wasn't a chef there. I was kind of a sous chef under this guy named Dennis Foy. And I had known Dennis previously at a restaurant in New Jersey, which was a competitor to 40 Main Street called Tarragon Tree. Dennis was, I liked him as a guy. He was fun. He was gregarious. Loved to party, have a good time. I didn't love stylistically what he was doing. And he was kind of an ex-military guy. I had enough discipline with nuns at Catholic school. (laughs) I didn't need some tyrant in the kitchen. But I took the job because I had to stay close to home. And after my dad passed away, I took a month off. And I came back and I worked a little bit and I said, I got to go. So I ended up going to France to work. And I got this gig at Michel Bras. And I was there for about two months. And the owner of the restaurant called me, who's my partner to this day still, and called me and said, we got some problems. Do you want to come back? So I came back and they made a change and I became the chef there. I think I was 26 or 27. And soon after that, got three stars by the Times. And as they say, that's all, folks. <laughs> that was it. I should have stopped right there. <laughs> <laughs> You've accomplished a few you know, things since then. <laughs> yeah, but it's funny. I still do dishes that I did back then. That was my most creative period because I didn't realize there was a business to run a restaurant. So I was just in the kitchen creating every day, just every single day, new dishes, new things, great product. It was a good restaurant in terms of food and wine. Really respect it, but... The underlying business plan, the lease, was just terrible. 
And the guys that owned it were all bankers and they kept it afloat. And finally I was like, stop giving me money. And they were like, really? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, we're done. I don't feel good about this anymore. But Robert Scott, who was the main investor, said, listen, why don't we just find another location downtown where rents are cheaper? And right around the same time, Danny Meyer, who had Union Square Cafe, I met him at an event. I was dishing out this crab and sear dish that I still to this day do. And he had one taste of it and was like, wow, this is great. So he kept coming to my restaurant. And I knew Union Square Cafe. At some point, I reached out to him and said, we should probably do a restaurant together. And his response was pretty funny. It was, I'll never do another restaurant in my life. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of weeks later, he called me up and said, let's talk. And we ended up traveling to Italy together. And I figured if we can travel together, we could probably work together. And we took about 10 days. So we lasted about 10 years together. So it was <laughs> a year per day. It worked out. But after we took a trip and got off the plane and had the rough idea for Gramercy Tavern. You were describing the people that were influencing you, the places that you felt you had to go, the skills. But I would be interested to know, what are the flavor profiles? What is the plating technique? What are the things that you think of as being your signature, the thing that you developed in that time that was your identity or signature? That's always a hard question to answer because I always said that Gramercy was a great restaurant. We just built something that comes along once every 50 years. But yet I couldn't put my finger on what kind of food that was. I always said it was American, but there was a lot of French influence. There was some Italian influence. But for me, it was just the way that I looked at food. And for me, everything is really visual, not in terms of plating, but in terms of how I think about food. It's very hard for me to lock myself in a room and just create. I have to see it. So it could be walking through a farmer's market, and especially the farmer's market was really important because... I find, and I think a lot of people with ADHD have the same issue, if I'm given unlimited amounts of resources, I'm lost. It's too much for me to process. If I focus and someone says, here's some Jerusalem artichokes, there's some celery root, and there's a game bird, and there's a couple of things you can add to that, I'm much better off. Then I could just riff on that for days. But it's like playing guitar and playing A minor pentatonic. Man, there's a lot you could do with that. <laughs> so for me, I find I can work much better doing that. So I find that I'm much more creative when I'm responding to what's around me versus me trying to just control and say, well, this is what I want. So it's hard. For me, it was always about, and this is why I wanted to work for Michel Brass so much, is that I read about him and he would go forage and his food... He talked about natural flavors, letting the food speak for itself. So that's what I was thinking. And so I was like, oh, I want to see this in practice. He also had just a really cool style about plating and his aesthetic was really neat. I always wanted to feel a sense of immediacy where the food was just cooked. It wasn't sitting around. It had a vibrancy to it. But the flavor also had a vibrancy. Like when you start eating stuff that you get from a farmer, it tastes very different than something you find in the supermarket. And that was exciting. And then looking at combinations, for me, it was pretty easy. It was more of a natural approach to cooking. So the style, that's what it was about. It was about the ingredients. And my job was sourcing. Either Green Market or there was a couple of companies that I used in Washington State. One forager back then, and foraging is big now, but back then I had this guy that was just exceptional. And another group out of Seattle called Fresh and Wild that always had like wild berries and good game and stuff. And D'Artagnan, they still do it, but it doesn't seem to be as good as it used to be. But we would get shot game out of Scotland. So we'd get grouse and partridge and real wild game yeah. and shot that you had to pick out. Just exceptional products. And various fish and stuff that were in the market and shellfish. And that was my job. I was maniacal about making sure that I had morels in season. I want them first. And that's what it was about. It was really ingredient driven. And if I tasted something that didn't taste like the way it was supposed to be, then something was wrong. So that's the long version of what my style is. I don't know. But it's also around this time that you create your first cookbook and you're starting to think in that way as well. And especially considering how important cookbooks had been to you. Yeah. I just wonder your approach to that as well. So Think Like a Chef was the first book. And to me, it was really a reinforcement of Jacques' law technique because I realized that people would ask me for recipes. And I was like, you know, so I want to do a book without recipes. Obviously, you can't do a cookbook without recipes. But a lot of it was, this is how I cook. This is how I think about it. And I literally had a chapter where it was really just techniques and how to roast fish, roast meat, braise, things like that. And then there was 
various vegetables, but the chapter that I love the most was the idea of trilogies. And this is a thing I always played with. You take three ingredients, and by altering those ingredients, you come up with different dishes. So we had a whole chapter on trilogies, and we used three different things. It was morels, ramps, and peas, all spring ingredients. And by just doing various applications, and times they could be garnished for fish or for chicken or whatever. They could be on their own. They could be turned into pastas. There's a lot that you can do with that. And then there was component cooking. The idea of putting things together, like people say, how do you come up with a dish? I mean, you look at it into component parts. If you're roasting a piece of meat and you're basting it with butter and some herbs and you want to add mushrooms to it, well, how do you do that? How do you treat all these ingredients? If you want to put asparagus into a dish, well, how? Is it just boiled with some butter? Is it roasted? Do you make a puree? Can you take that puree now and turn it into a flan or something? So there's a lot you can do. You can start drilling down and keep the essence of the food, but just manipulate it a little bit so it changes it. And I'm really proud of that book. To this day, people every now and then will go, I still use that book. I use it a lot. It's like covered in all kinds of food and great. Like, great. Yeah. <laughs> and this was right around the same time that you are found in craft as yep. well. So first of all, tell me about the name, because it seems to me that this is the theme. This is what's running through everything is this attention to craft. Yeah, that's exactly right. So what happened was I was still at Gramercy Tavern. And in fact, most people forget this. I was at Gramercy Tavern for two years when craft opened and I was doing double duty for two years before I sold Gramercy Tavern. And in fact, I was going to buy Gramercy from Danny. The deal was all done. And over the weekend, I thought about it and said, no, this is what I want. And he agreed. And that was it. Also, right around the same time that I started doing Top Chef. So now there's a whole different clientele coming in. And they come to craft and I start hearing, this is it? <laughs> and, I, and now I sell Gramercy. Now all I have is craft. And I get this crowd coming and going, this is it? And the restaurant was wildly successful. Lines out the door, booked every night, get three stars in the Times and James Beard, best new restaurant. I mean, I think a year later, we got Bon Appetit Restaurant of the Year. I mean, I was flying high. It was a great time to be me in New York. <laughs> it really was. And the restaurant was just, again, Marco Canora was a chef de cuisine. Jonathan Benno was a sous chef. All these rock stars in this kitchen now. And it was great. And we were able to do a lot. But I started hearing this grumbling. And I also noticed, and not that I keep score by the Beard Foundation at all, but I noticed that also I go from being nominated to not even making a round of 20. I was like, what the hell? What the hell's going on? Well, then it was like, well, you're doing TV, so you're not a chef anymore. I like, Fuck, it didn't take me six <laughs> weeks to do. What am I doing the rest of my life? Six weeks to shoot a TV show. So I started getting this chip on my shoulder, going like, I could do a lot more than this. This is what I chose to do. And that led to this Tom's Tuesday dinner where we took our private dining room and turned it into like a pop-up and I went crazy. <laughs> and I remember the first time I did it, this woman goes, I'm a regular craft. I had no idea you can cook this way. I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> and then, of course, I win that year. <laughs> Beer Awards, sure. I win that year. <laughs> so it's now reinforcing that maybe I need to do this other food. But I don't have that outlet now. We did revive right before the pandemic. We started doing Tuesday dinners again. But since then, I turned it into an Italian trattoria. You know, every now and then I still think, I don't feel I have anything more to prove, but yet I still feel that I do. It's this struggle thinking like, you know, I could slow down now. I've got good teams, but there's something nagging me that I may still want to do something new. You know, craft over the years changed. And I think we actually, the funny thing about craft is that I never wanted to have an Italian restaurant. And yet Marco, who was the chef de cuisine, I worked very closely with him at Kraft, and he really bought into the whole concept. His family's from Tuscany, his mother. And when he was at Gramercy with me, I sent him to this restaurant Cibreo in Tuscany. He wanted to go and work there. We got him a stage there. And he came back talking about this idea of sofrito. And Cibreo is a great restaurant, and it's all based around sofrito and different types of sofrito. And when I say sofrito, it's not like the Spanish sofrito. This is Italian, finely, finely diced. It could be onion, celery, fennel, or you could add a carrot to it if you're making a darker one. It's all cooked in olive oil for about two hours, and that's the base for so many dishes. So he brings this back, and so we base a lot of what we're doing at Kraft on sofrito. So we're really doing Italian food without calling it Italian. And I remember Sirio Maccioni from the Cirque, his wife came in one day with like 12 people to celebrate her birthday, and she took me aside. She said, this is the best Italian restaurant in the city. And I was like, Italian? She said, yeah, it's Italian. I was like, don't tell me about that. <laughs> At that point, we'd have to call a restaurant Fato Amano or something like that, or whatever the equivalent of craft is, artisanal. But it was very Italian, and especially the style of eating, family style platters. Over the years, it was changed. And every time I have new chef cuisine, they wanted, and I'd always let them because I know they want to create and they'd start moving away.
away from the original intention. And then recently, right before the pandemic, we got it back to the original, which was a lot of fun to do. And I have a chef now who really buys into that. So we're almost back to what it was, which is kind of neat. So thinking about those days when you said you were flying high in New York yeah. and everything is going well for you and no particular need to take on something new, but then Top Chef comes yeah. along. There's this offer to do a TV show. So the Jeopardy answer was, this chef said no to this show three times before saying yes. And the answer is Top Chef. <laughs> my wife said, this is crazy. If you had asked anyone in my family if I could pull off a TV show, they would have said, no, I'm quiet. I keep to myself. My brother's a ham. He was like, this should be me. <laughs> so I was like, you know, fine. So I agreed to do the show with a couple of buts. One was that if I'm going to be the judge of the show, the judges are making a decision who stays and goes. I'm certainly not interested in having a producer tell me who's going to stay and go based on how fun they are. Right. And they said, fine. Said, okay. And after the first season, I was like, guys, you got to make this more serious. You can't do a show like this. My interest is making sure that my peers look at this as something that's worthwhile. My industry actually cares about this show. And right now, it's not going to happen. It's kind of fun, but it's more reality than I'm comfortable with. And the food is secondary. And it's like a clown show. And the chef who won that year, and some of the chefs were very good. I mean, Tiffany Faison was in year one. She's doing great right now. Harold Dieterle, Leanne Wong. And there's some good chefs. So you can't have home cooks. They can't compete. It's not going to work. And finally, the third season, they came around and started only bringing in professionals. And when we did, I think it was our fifth season in Las Vegas, and that was the Voltaggio season and Kevin Gillespie and that whole group. That was the season we won our Emmy. It was funny because when you submit an episode for the Emmys, not the whole season, and that was the episode. It was the foodiest episode we've ever done. It was in the MGM, and it was all these French chefs sitting around a table eating this food that was supposed to be French-inspired. Half the conversation was in French, <laughs> And this is as foodie, as non-reality as possible. And that's the episode we won our Emmy for. So they're like, all right. And it definitely went in that direction, which I'm really happy about. And for me, all I could be is myself on the show. I'm not going to be a clown. And I also felt that knowing what the chefs were going through, they're putting in 16-hour days with seven cameras in their face and getting judged and dealing with the clock and also leaving their home. They're not allowed phones, TV, books, magazines, music, nothing. They're all living together. This is really hard on them. So I owe it to them, to be honest. And it was a little more combative in the earlier seasons only because they were. And there's a lot less of it now. But I always viewed my role as like a mentor. Like, I'm going to treat them as the cooks in my kitchen. They're putting up food, and I'm going to critique them. I'm going to be honest about it. And it's never about me. It's not about my personal preferences. It's widely known that I don't like okra. If somebody makes me an okra dish, I'm like, how dare you make me an okra dish? You're going home. No, I judge it based on what it should be. And it doesn't matter if I like it or not. It matters whether or not they cooked it properly. And that was it. I look back on it as a great decision. <laughs> and it's something I really enjoy. We just finished shooting. We were in Milwaukee. I just got back Saturday. And I enjoy doing it still. I enjoy the interaction, especially this season was great. But last six or seven seasons, the chefs changed. And it's like they're hungry for feedback. And they all mentioned that this changed the way I cook. It changed the way I approach food. And the feedback was so good and so honest. And even though it's hard to hear sometimes, they seem to take it in. So I get to mentor a lot of chefs this way and have some influence over what's happening now. I also get to see a lot of really good young chefs who I normally would have access to. So it's kind of neat. Well, and I would say too, beyond the influence that the show has very clearly had on raising the profile of that young talent, it seems also to have given you a platform that you could use in other ways. And you've been very out front about seeing this celebrity as something that allows you to talk about food policy and mm -hmm. issues that maybe people wouldn't have listened to you yeah. before if you were just a well-known chef. Right. Yeah, so I guess about nine years ago now, my wife did a film called A Place at the Table, and it was about hunger in America. She was mentoring a young girl living in Brooklyn. Actually, her family was living in a shelter when they first met. And we would have her over to the house, and she was clearly hungry whenever she came over and would make meals. It was interesting because she always wanted the healthy food. She wanted vegetables and salads and stuff. We would send food home to her family. And in New York City, she was learning disabled. And if the city can't meet the needs of the student, we can get her into a private setting. And not some fancy private school, but there's all these private schools for kids with learning disabilities. So we got her into a program. And the first week, we get a phone call from the principal saying, this girl's clearly hungry and she doesn't have food. And 
my wife doing what she does instead of saying, let's fix this problem, she had to understand the problem and understand the problem on a much larger scale. And my wife's not a documentary filmmaker. She does more narrative film and she's a writer. And she reached out to a friend who was a documentary filmmaker and together they made this film, A Place to the Table, which was about hunger in America. And I knew a little bit about the stuff that goes on in schools because my mother ran a school lunch program. But my wife started doing research and the kind of research that I would never do. It's just how she's made and a deep dive into it and very, very quickly like looked at this and said, people aren't hungry for the normal reasons. It's not war or famine or drought. We have the resources in this country. We don't have the political will. And then that led her right to Washington and talking to members of Congress, especially people like Jim McGovern, who's just been a champion for people that are struggling and other people. And I was in the film. I was a producer on the film. And I had a soapbox from the show. So I got on that soapbox and threw myself into that world. But it was all because of this film that my wife made. And someone asked me, like, why? And I was like, listen, I can go to Washington and talk to people who make decisions. Because, again, once you realize that this is a political issue, well, how do you fix it? You go to where the politicians are, right? Mm -hmm. So Ken Cook, who headed up the environmental working group, he was one of the talking heads in the film. And he reached out to me and said, hey, I got an idea. So from that, we started Food Policy Action. We graded Congress on how they voted around food issues. So it was hunger, clean water, farming. GMO labeling was something we actually worked on. And I remember the first year we published a scorecard, people like pushed it aside. Second year, got a little bit of rumbling. Third year, we started having people say, wow, why my score so low? And it's like, well, this was your vote. And they were like, well, had I known, maybe I would, <laughs> oh, okay, great, I mean... so this is working. <laughs> And I think our fourth year, we actually got involved in a race. Nancy Pelosi on the stage that night is helping with us. And I was going to Capitol Hill once a month at this point. And because whenever we had a policy agenda, we would have to go lobby. So I was an unpaid, unregistered lobbyist going up there on behalf of Food Policy Action, meeting with members of Congress. And I'm a liberal Democrat, but mostly meeting with Republicans because that's who we had to get to come over. And I got to say, it's not shocking at what's going on right now in our politics, but behind closed doors, it's not what you say. People do work together. It's just they can't say that because if they say they're working together, some districts you go back to, you get primaried and you lose your job. It was an interesting time. I don't do it as much anymore. The whole restaurant industry is going through a kind of mm. reckoning. Me Too reckoning, questions about equity and yeah. diversity, and I think positive conversations. But I wonder just how you see your role in this transformation and how you're responding to it. That's a tough one. The Me Too reckoning started happening before the pandemic. Yeah. Listen, every industry, rightfully so, went through it. There were some pretty public people in our industry who had to get taken down and did and yeah. did some horrible things and it caught up with them. Yeah. I always have a pretty clear conscience about what I've done in the past and how I treat my employees. You have to be an advocate, you have to be a supporter, but in terms of me becoming kind of spokesperson for it, I'm not comfortable doing that. I'm comfortable leading by example and doing what I do in my four walls, but I'd rather work behind the scenes. So if someone calls me now and recommends a chef, I'm not thinking the way I used to think where I would like throw out a couple of white guys who I knew. Now I'm starting to think who else is out there who can do great things. When I get a phone call from restaurant associates saying, what do you think of Kwame Oichi? I'm like, he's fucking awesome. Yeah. And definitely should work with him. So what I can do is my role is being someone who's gonna support and try to make this as diverse as possible. Our industry wasn't as diverse as it should be for a lot of reasons. And it's definitely changed and it's changed for the best. And for me, I want that kid who maybe was interested in our industry, but never saw anybody that looked like them in the industry as an example. A few people here and there, but now they can look and go, wow, there's this family reunion that's happening in the Salamander Resort that Kwame Oichi started with Food and Wine magazine. And I look at that and it's all black chefs. I can be that yeah, I want to be in this industry. That's just great for our industry. It's like any industry. If you could see yourself in that role, you can be it, right? If you don't see yourself, then it's not there, which really drives me crazy about what's going on with books in this country. All we're talking about is someone who can see themselves in that school, yeah. someone who can see themselves in that book, whether it's someone who is sexually diverse or someone who's struggling with their identity, and to see that there's someone like me in that book in the classroom. And this is the real tragedy behind what's going on. But in my industry, I don't know if a 60-year-old white guy needs to be the spokesperson for the industry, to tell you the truth. No, I, I don't. really don't think they do. So I would rather be a supporter at this point than be a leader. 
I don't need to lead that. I just need to lead when it comes to supporting someone. Yeah. Yeah, maybe leadership isn't exactly the right word, but the show continues to be a major platform, and the show has changed. This is Bravo. They've always looked at diversity when it came to casting. Always. From day one. And even more so now. They make it work. But now, even the producer on the show, where we are doing challenges with First Nations people and things like that to really bring awareness. We are at an old Baptist church in Houston doing food from communities that settled in these areas. So we're taking this stuff on. Right. The show does a really great job of it, which is another thing I love about the show. You would think of a reality food show, competition show, that's going to take on some social issues, and they, they do. And it's not preachy either. It's a celebration, which is what it should be. We go and celebrate this style of food, and we're trying to get all the chefs say, you don't know this food, we're going to teach you about it, and you're going to do it. You're going to figure it out. And right. it's good to see. Where it's usually the minority trying to figure out the Eurocentric food that you have to do. So we flipped it on his head. So I have to ask, before mm-hmm. we conclude here, if every generation is finding their kind of way into thinking about restaurants through something distinctive on television, mm-hmm. certainly the bear has mm-hmm. captured the popular imagination and it's once again created a vision of what the kitchen looks like. I wonder what you think of the show. I love it. But that show's not about food, not about restaurants. (laughs) That's about generational just anguish in that family. And that's what's so good about it, especially the second season, the Christmas Eve, the Seven Fishes episode is just brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And that's when the whole show changes. Yeah. And that's when you understand what it's really about. I like it a lot. Maddie was on Top Chef this past season, and he was great. I love it. There's some things that I scratch my head about, though. Well, that's what I wanted. Yeah, yeah. So I think it does give you a pretty realistic view of the stress that's going on in the kitchen. So it's little insider things for me. So, for instance, the chef, Carmi, there was some mention that he worked at Noma and maybe Eleven Madison. But yet all the details in the kitchen all come out of French Laundry. <laughs> The tape, the little (laughs) sayings on the past. That's all French laundry stuff, right? And I worked with Thomas Keller years ago and recognize a lot of it. So that's a little disconnect for me too. The other thing that would never happen, and I hate to even say this because I love the show, and I've told the showrunner, the founder of the show, how much I love it. Never in a million years, if you're doing your first restaurant, would you ever turn your menu over to the chef de cuisine? It just (laughs) doesn't happen. Would never. Maybe you'll have to do a dish. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) But that would never happen. They're your soldier. They're there to execute. But it was funny, the sous chef character, the first night expediting, calling out an order and saying, please and thank you. (laughs) That was rich. (laughs) But I love it. I think it's great. The pace of it feels right. The scenes in the kitchen feels right. I love the arc of the cousin from being a total like piece of junk to finding himself through Will Goddard's book. <laughs> it's cool. The big bookshelf, my book's in there. Crap the cookies on the shelf. It's really cool. <laughs> I like it much more than the menu. Oh. I hated that. Yeah. Didn't like that at all. Food was beautiful. So many cranted the food. It just bugged me. The idea that someone's going to kill you and you stand there and go, <laughs> what's the next course? <laughs> no, no, I'm grabbing a knife. I'm cutting my way out of that thing. Sorry, I'm not sitting here for this. <laughs> <laughs> no. That's why I hate sitting through long tasting menus. I feel like I'm getting tortured. But no, the bear is great. I can't wait for season three. It's going to be cool. Yeah. That's great. Well, Tom, I can't thank you enough for spending all of this time with us, especially on a rainy day where there's so much going on at the restaurant. I'm hoping by the time I get back there, it's less hectic because I really don't want to work the line tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to Switchyard. I'm your host, Ted Genoways. If you liked this episode and you want to support our podcast, please share it with your friends, post about it on social media, and leave a rating and review. Switchyard is a production of the University of Tulsa and Public Radio Tulsa. Thanks to our partners at FERN, the Food and Environment Reporting Network, for their support of this episode and Switchyard Magazine's special food issue. You can order a copy of the issue on our website at switchyardmag.com. We made this episode with executive producer Marianne Andre and Charles Lipper and Cassa Lee at Volubility Podcasting. Thanks as always to TU President Brad Carson. Brad Carson.